I'm delighted to be here today. We've got Mary Beth Franklin, a social security expert and author and, um, and frequent presenter on the topic of social security. And of course, for this uh, today's uh, session is, is uh, facilitated by Paul Merriman. Um, Paul is a uh, former board member of the Community Foundation, an incredible communitarian who spent his entire life working in the investment industry uh, and in retirement decided he wanted to make sure that everyone had access to good sound financial advice. Uh, and he's formed the Amer Merriman Education Foundation, who is our presenting partner uh, for today. Um, as we get things started, I just want to, um, as we do, um, Bainbridge Community or Bainbridge Island is located within the um, Aboriginal territory of the Suquamish tribe. Uh, as Chief Seattle said, every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and every grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. So as we begin, we, we acknowledge that we are on the land uh, uh, that, was the, uh, that is the Aboriginal territory of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquamish live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here the Suquamish live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations, as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty. So I wanna welcome you all here. As we get started, um, just wanna note that there is a Q&A uh, button in the bottom of your Zoom link. That is a great place to put questions. Um, Paul and, and Mary Beth will be speaking for a while, but we'll be monitoring that, that chat. And if we don't get to your question during the course of their conversation, we'll include it uh, at, the, at the end. Also wanted to note that this is um, closed caption. You should see a little CC live transcript button at the bottom. If you'd like to press that, it should uh, enable the closed captioning if, if, if you prefer. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul and welcome you both here. And we're very excited to, uh, to learn more. That's great. Thank you, Jim. And thanks to all the folks that have come out. This is the last of the financial literacy series for this year. And I got to tell you, I, I just think it's been terrific. And to finish, to finish the, the cl batting cleanup is Mary Beth Franklin. Uh, she is an uh, amazingly experienced and, and talented uh, educator, writer, uh, she's a certified financial planner, and uh, in her history of working in the financial industry, it includes working at Kiplinger's. It, it, it includes working in, in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill, reporting for the United Press International. And, uh, and, and she also has written a terrific book on Social Security. It's called your social security retirement benefits. And I was gonna donate the entire day to that book just to make sure that I was up to speed. But what happened, unfortunately, was I went to her podcast and, uh, and it was absolutely fabulous. I've got to, not only do I recommend that book, but I recommend the podcast it is entitled The Retirement Repair Shop. And she's interviewing some of the smartest people in the industry. And in fact, there it was, the good, the bad, the ugly about Social Security. It was perfect. And so Mary Beth, thank you so much for joining us and uh, subjecting uh, yourself to all the questions that we're going to have because interestingly enough, this is the most popular topic uh, in the series. When we had it some years ago, it was by far the most popular. So uh, Jim commented, maybe we should do this every year, but uh, we're lucky to have you here tonight. Thank you. And we asked people for questions. I think half of them, there must have been a hundred questions. Half of them or more were all about making a smart decision about when to claim Social Security. So why don't we start at the top and, and talk about that topic? And of course, as you might expect, those questions came from all sorts of people, divorcees, uh, single people, married people, people with lots of years in between their ages, etc. Let's 
start with the most common is it and the question would be is it a common mistake people make or are people making the right decision when you look at the most common and that is i think the couple husband and wife who are are claiming you know when to start their social security what should they know what should they do and what should they be careful not to do well, first of all, Paul, I wanted to thank you and Jim for inviting me on this program and introducing me to your audience. Um, I am equally passionate, as are you, of the importance of financial literacy, particularly when it comes to Social Security. And you're right, it's such a popular topic because, frankly, we have all worked so hard and paid so much for our Social Security benefits in the form of those FICA payroll taxes that have been taking chunks out of our paycheck our entire lives. It's important for people to realize that that 7.65% of FICA taxes that come out of our paycheck and our employers match that amount in taxes pays not for our future Social Security benefit, but for today's beneficiaries, our parents, our grandparents. And we hope going forward in the future that the younger workers with their payroll taxes will be paying our benefit. Don't think of this as like an IRA. There isn't a file somewhere in Washington with your name, social security number, and a pot of money for you. It doesn't work like that. And I will talk about um, what your benefit is based on, um, how you make a decision based on your marital status, your age, frankly, your health and your other financial resources. The first thing to start with is social security benefits are based on your average lifetime earnings, basically your top 35 years of average earnings. That's a piece of the puzzle. The other big piece is your age when you first claim. That is the big determinant of how much you'll get for the rest of your life. Now, a lot of people claim as early as they can at age 62. And that may be appropriate in their situation if they need the money um, or if they're in poor health and not likely to live a long time, that can make sense. But they have to realize that if they claim at that earliest age, their social security benefits will be reduced by 25% or more for the rest of their lives. It's a permanent reduction. In addition, People who claim benefits before their full retirement age, which depending on your birth year is anywhere between 66 and 67. If you claim those benefits early and you continue to work, having earnings from a job or self-employment, you could temporarily lose some or all of your social security benefits if you make too much money. And too much money is about $20,000 a year. So the first thing is, Let's look at where the Social Security benefit fits in your overall retirement income strategy. What other sources do you have? Maybe an IRA or 401k, maybe home equity, maybe you're going to work part time. It's all part of the picture. And let's start with your first question. Married couples, what should we do? I generally suggest that in married couples, now traditionally in American married couples, the man tends to be about two years or older tends to make more money, and frankly, tends to die earlier. So the big question that married couples have to ask is, how do I maximize the survivor benefit? Because Social Security is not just a retirement benefit while you're alive, it's a survivor benefit for the spouse that's left behind. And quick math lesson, a spousal benefit, if I am a working woman, I'm an entire, entitled to my own retirement benefit on my own earnings record. I'm also married to somebody who's entitled to Social Security. So technically, I'm entitled to a spousal benefit that's worth half of my husband's benefit. I don't get both. I get the higher of the two benefits. And it depends on how old I am when I was claiming. But if he dies first, which is likely... I am now going to step up to a survivor benefit that's worth 100% of what he was getting. And at that point, my smaller benefit goes away. So how do we make the most of that survivor benefit? I suggest that in a typical married couple, 
we have one spouse that has the bigger benefit, which tends to be the husband, have him wait as long as possible up until age 70 to get the biggest benefit possible. Because for every year he postpones claiming beyond his full retirement age up until age 70, he's getting an extra 8% a year. That's a smoking hot deal. So if his full retirement age benefit at 66 is say $2,000 a month and he waits till 70, he's gonna get 32% more, $2,640 a month. And the difference, between claiming as soon as possible, in his case, at 62, when he would get 75% of his benefit versus waiting as long as possible up until age 70 to get 132% of his benefit. The difference is he can increase his monthly social security benefits by 76% for the rest of his life. Now, as a certified financial planner, there is no investment that I can recommend that is going to increase by 76% over an eight year period, smoking a hot deal. But, so let's say that's what the husband does. Now, what does the wife do? Again, it depends. Let's say she's one of those women that hasn't worked her whole life. Maybe she stayed home and raised kids part of the time. Her benefit's relatively small. And let's say she's not working right now. She may wanna go ahead and claim her social security benefits as early as 62. I know that sounds like heresy. I just said she's going to get a cut. Why would I do that? Well, it brings some cash flow into the household, takes away a bit of the sting of having the husband wait longer. She doesn't have to worry about an earnings restriction because she's not working. And here's the secret. Even though she collects her own reduced retirement benefits early at 62, and those retirement benefits are reduced Reduced for the rest of their lives has no impact on her survivor benefit. If she is at least full retirement age, when she is widowed, she will step up to 100% of what her husband was collecting, including those delayed retirement credits, and then her smaller benefit goes away. Now that works for the, the wife who's not a big earner. Let's say we have another dual income couple and the wife is still working and a substantial earner. She will probably want to wait till her full retirement age to claim when the earnings restrictions go away. But otherwise, that same strategy may hold. Have one wait till 70, have one claim at full retirement age. So is it not true then, when they wait until that age 70 and the government gives us increases and in inflationary uh, increases, that increase is going to be on a bigger number. I mean, everything becomes a bigger number growing. It's the compounding effect that makes it bigger. And of course, we don't know what that inflationary rate is, is, is going to be. But it is a wonderful thing to do if they can do it. But what are the conditions that you see that people aren't able to do that or don't think they could do it, but you show them how? they can do it. And first of all, I'm glad you brought out that point. The example I was giving of that extra 8% a year is simply the delayed retirement credit, the bonus you get for waiting up until age 70. In addition, every year that there is a cost of living adjustment awarded, that also increases your future benefit. So if you have waited to get the biggest benefit possible, and then there's a cost of living adjustment, that percentage, that cost of living adjustment is going to be applied to a bigger dollar base, which means your annual increase is going to be better. And speaking of cost of living adjustment, that's really in the news. For 2022, Social Security benefits increased by 5.9%. Now that is the biggest cost of living adjustment we have seen in 40 years. I am hearing from some people Wow, such a big cola. I guess I should claim Social Security benefits now to cash in on that big cost of living adjustment. Whoa, you don't need to do that. If you are 62 years or older right now in 2022, that means you are eligible for Social Security whether or not you have claimed it. And if you are eligible for Social Security, every cost of living adjustment that is awarded between the times you're 62 up to the age of claim 
is baked into your future benefit. Now, if you're younger than 62, nothing you can do about it. You're not going to get that 5.9% COLA baked into your future benefit. But guess what? The way inflation is going, next year's COLA might be even bigger. And if you're 62 next year, that cost of living adjustment will be included in your future benefit. And can that spouse that did not have an income late in their career, what would they have to do to earn enough credits that they would actually get some, earn some social security uh, rather than having the half of the, uh, of the husbands? Well, great point. Um, what determines your social security benefits? Your top 35 years of lifetime earnings. Let's say I only have 20 years of earnings because I was staying home for 15, raising my kids. Social Security is still going to divide by 35. That means I'm going to have 20 years of earnings and 15 years of zeros. But every, and when I average that out, it's going to be a, a lower average lifetime earning and consequently a lower Social Security benefit. But every year that I continue to work, regardless of my age, even if I'm beyond my full retirement age and I am already collecting Social Security benefits, every year that I work, adds to my earnings record. And if it has replaced one of those zero years or my current earnings are higher than a previous year that was used in the original calculation, my future benefits will automatically increase. So that's a great message, even for people who maybe have a modest social security benefit and they're planning to retire, but maybe they wanna work part-time. If, as long as you make about $5,000 a year, you're getting your full maximum four credits a year. You need a minimum of 40 credits, essentially 10 years of work in the private sector to be eligible for social security. But the amount you receive is based on your average lifetime earnings over the top 35 years and your age at the time you plan. Oh, Paul, I'm sorry, you're on mute. I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry. The dogs were barking. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, one, the, the excuses that people come up with for taking it early, uh, what, what is the legitimate? If they came in and said, I'm only going to live three more years or five more years, uh, that maybe that would, uh, would be forgivable. But what are the real excuses that, uh, that you think are legitimate? for taking it early? Well, I say that the idea of delaying claiming your social security benefits with the idea that it would be worth more later is a bit like the lottery. You must be present to win. If you don't think you're gonna be around a long time that perhaps delaying your social security benefit is not a good idea. But frankly, most Americans underestimate how long they'll live. On average, a 65 year old man and woman going to live to about 85 and half of all Americans are going to live longer than that. If you're part of a married couple, you have a 25% chance that one of you is going to live into your 90s. And again, there's the idea of how do I protect the spouse that's left behind? But certainly, let's say I was one of those people that during the COVID pandemic, my job disappeared. I need the money. If you need the money, go ahead and take it. That's what it's there for. Do not feel embarrassed about that. But if you say, gee, I hear Social Security is going broke in a few years. I think I'd better grab it now while I can. Well, I never think claiming Social Security benefits early out of fear is a legitimate reason. It's a bit like saying, I have all this money in the stock market and the market just went down 30%. Gee, I don't like that. I'm going to go all to cash. The only thing I've done there is guarantee that I have a lot of loss. Same thing with claiming Social Security benefits early because you're afraid the system is going bankrupt. You have just guaranteed you locked in the loss. Now, is it going to go bankrupt? No. Let me define terms here. Shorthand, those FICA taxes that we've been paying is what pay Social Security benefits. About 40 years ago, 1983, Social Security was in real trouble. And that's when there was all sorts of reforms that were implemented, including what was very smart. The uh, Social Security Commission back then said, you know, this huge baby boomer 
generation of over 76 million people are going to start retiring around 2010. Why don't we start collecting more FICA taxes now in the early 80s and stockpile that money for the days when the baby boomers start retiring? Those stockpiles, those reserves are called the trust funds. Well, for nearly 40 years, those trust funds have been growing and growing and growing over a trillion dollars of the trust funds. Around 2010, as predicted, two things happened. Baby boomers started to retire and we had this huge recession. A lot of people lost their jobs. They weren't paying FICA taxes. And so for the first time in 2010, the FICA tax revenues alone were not sufficient to pay social security benefits. So the government started tapping the interest that had been building up on those trust funds to help pay the benefits. That worked fine to about 2021. Whoa, we had a pandemic. A lot of other people lost their jobs and a lot more people because of the aging, the baby boomers started to retire. So for the first time, FICA taxes alone and interest on the trust funds alone were not enough to pay social security benefits. So for the first time, the government started dipping into the principal of those social security trust funds. And they will continue dipping into those trust funds until they run dry, expected sometime around 2034, if Congress does nothing, which I don't think will happen. In that worst case scenario of Congress doing nothing, what does it mean when the trust funds go dry? It means there would be enough money from ongoing FICA taxes to pay about 75% of promised benefits. It's not going bankrupt. But nobody, you, me, or anybody in this audience will be satisfied with 75% of promised Social Security benefits. And Congress knows this. So senior citizens are the largest, most powerful voting bloc in the country. There are more than 70 million people receiving Social Security benefits. They will fix this. And it is not rocket science. I will give you two examples. Um, the FICA taxes we pay, a portion of it, 6.2%, actually funds Social Security. The other piece funds Medicare. If we gradually raise that FICA tax by one-tenth of 1% 1 every year for 25 years, that solves about the other half of the, half of the funding problem. If at the same time, you gradually raise the full retirement age, which will be 67 for people born in 1960 or later, if you gradually increase that over decades to 70, and I'm talking for today's two-year-olds, they're gonna to live to 120, they'll get used to it. Those two things alone would solve the long-term financing problem. And here's one more piece that's so fascinating from social security history. Back in 1983, the social security commission said, as long as 95% of U.S. wages, excuse me, 90% of U.S. wages were taxed for FICA purposes to fund Social Security. Social Security would never, ever run out of money. But when we're taxed to pay Social Security taxes, we only pay up to a certain level of wages. This year, it's $147,000. If you make $147,000 or less, you pay FICA taxes on all of your wages. If you make more than that, you do not pay social security taxes on the excess. So many people are making so much more than $147,000 a year that the amount of US wages being taxed for FICA purposes has dropped to 83% of US wages instead of 90%. If that was gradually raised again over decades, solves the problem forever. So there are solutions out there. These are not mathematical problems, they're political problems. And I think each one of us as citizens need to contact our congressmen and senators and say, we know this is a future problem. We give you our permission to talk about it because from the politician standpoint, they have no good news. They're either gonna to say to you, hey, I'm gonna raise your taxes, I'm gonna cut your benefits or I'm gonna do both. They're afraid to talk about it. We know it's got to be done. And the longer lead way you give us, like in 1983, the last big reforms nearly 40 years ago are not fully implemented yet. The last piece, raising the full retirement age to 67, does not kick into 2027. So you're not worried. I'm not worried. 
That's great. And, uh, and, and the people then that are panicking and taking money immediately uh, are actually taking a, a risk themselves in, in taking that step. So you're a financial planner and an expert on social security. And I wanna get back to these claiming strategies in, in a minute here, but I am curious, um, do you actually have a regular uh, practice as a CFP or do you specialize in social security to help people who have particularly difficult situations? I have a very interesting business model. Yes, I am a certified financial planner, I'm also a lifelong journalist over 40 years. Um, my focus is on financial education. So I write a weekly column for investment news. As you can see this banner behind me, they pay me to write a weekly column answering questions about social security for financial advisors and their clients. And because I do a lot of uh, education like this in radio and television programs, lots of consumers contact me with their individual questions. I do not charge for that advice. But I say to them, here's your devil's bargain. I'm going to write about it. Yeah. Your only choice is I quote you or I don't quote you. But it, I consider it field research because it lets me know where the confusion is among the general public, where their questions are, and where I can be most useful in focusing my columns. So um, yes, I do answer people's questions. Um, people can Google me, look up Mary Beth Franklin, you'll find how to reach me through investment news. And if it's a really tough question, there are some excellent services that charge some modest fees that can really help people untangle complicated social security situations. Can we talk about those people for a minute since you brought it up? Because the problem so many of us have is how do we, how do we qualify the, 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 how good they are? I mean, there are, there are people who do workshops for the public and they talk about social security because it draws a lot of people. And then what they, in many cases, not all, in many cases, what they really want to do is help them solve their social security problems so they can sell them an annuity. And I'm not saying annuities are evil, but it's a master plan because it's a very profitable business. But how would a person, what, what designation would you look to to know that a person was a specialist or would any certified financial planner be up to speed that would qualify for your definition of a specialist? Well, um, there is an organization called the National Social Security Association. I'm glancing to the certificate on my wall because I do have that certificate. And you can go to their website, National Social Security Association, and they'll have listings of professionals in your geographic area that can help you. Some of them are certified financial advisors. Some of them are registered investment advisors. Some of them are, are people who do not um, sell any kind of financial products, but just help with uh, social security decisions. There's another group I like a lot. Um, one is called Social Security Advisors. That's advisors with an O, A-D-V-I-S-O-R-S.com. They do charge modest fees like $100 for this, $100 for that. Um, mm -hmm. But I send people to them who have had problems. Gee, I filed for this benefit, but I realized I got bad advice and I should have gotten some retroactive benefits. Can you help me? When it's a complicated situation like that, I send them to the experts. There are other sites. One is called covisum.com, C-O-V-I-S-U-M.com. Another one is called uh, socialsecurityanalyzer.com. Both of these have consumer friendly sites as well as sites for financial advisors that can help people based on their personal situation, their marital status, the amount of their individual um, social security benefits, find the appropriate claiming strategy for that couple or that individual. And I feel like for such a um, important decision, I really think deciding when and how to claim social security benefits is probably one of the most important 
retirement decisions people make, I think it might be worth spending a few bucks. Now, um, AARP.org also has a free a social security claiming um, strategy calculator. That might be a good place to start. It used to be a lot more complicated. There were, were a lot of different claiming strategies that particularly married people could use. A lot of those have gone away, um, but there is one remaining strategy depending on when you were born. And write this date down, January 1st, 1954. If you were born on or before that date and you are currently married, or you are divorced after being married at least 10 years, it is possible that you can exercise a very valuable claiming strategy called restricting a claim to spousal benefits. It essentially allows you to collect benefits as a spouse that 50% of your husband's or wife's full retirement age benefit while your own retirement benefit continues to grow by 8% a year but you can only do this if you were born before 1954. That means this year in 2022, you have to be 69 by the end of this year. Or um, So basically there's two birth years that can still use this. If you were born in 1952 or 1953, you can do this. And I'm going to give you an example from my own life. I was born in December, 1954, too late to do anything fancy. But my husband was born in 1952. So when I reached my full retirement age of 66, I filed for my social security benefits. And again, you're probably saying, oh, the social security guru is, didn't wait. The reason I filed at my full retirement age, two reasons, I continued to work, but the earnings restrictions went away once I reached my full retirement age. And now it triggered a spousal benefit for my husband. At that point, my husband, who was born in 1952, could file online, just like I did at ssa.gov, but because it recognized his birth year was before January 1st, 1954, and that he was married, the question says, if you were entitled to your own social security benefits and that as a spouse, would you like to collect spousal benefits only? And he said, yes. And he was able to collect half of my full retirement age benefit amount now that's in addition to what I was receiving. And when he turned 70, which was just a few weeks ago, he filed again online, opening a new request for benefits because now he was gonna file on his own retirement record. And he got that full benefit, the extra 32% in delayed retirement credits, which just came last week. He was very happy. Now, should he predecease me, which actuarially is likely, I would then step up to his larger survivor benefit and my own smaller benefit would go away. But we could only do this because he was born before 1954. So I am back, I think. Am I, am I working? I, I just talked right through you, Paul. That's I great. I love here. it. <laughs> that, that Brilliantly done, by the way. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so let's, I, I ran into a fellow who's been married several times. And uh, he, he's not as old as I am, but he's close. And uh, his ex-wives are older. Uh, and they are all getting uh, a Social Security check based on his earnings. Is that the way it works? It sure is. I like to call that the Johnny Carson rule. Uh, who was married four times, all to women that began with a J, Joanne, et cetera. This is how it works. And um, now, understandably, Social Security is a very confusing program. Uh, it has more than 2,700 rules, and I promise not to go through all of them. Uh, but a lot of them are exceptions, and a lot of the exceptions apply to divorced spouses. So let's go through some basics. What does it take to be an eligible divorced spouse to be able to claim benefits on an ex. First, you must be married at least 10 years. It can't be nine years, 11 months, and 29 days. It's got to be 10 years plus. So think of it this way. There must be at least a decade between I do and I don't. And you tell every one of your friends who's thinking about a divorce, stick in there for 10 years. 
And make sure their divorce attorney knows that too. Now, in addition, um, assuming you were married at least 10 years, divorced, and you're currently single. Now, you may have married somebody else in between, but that subsequent marriage ended in death or divorce. You are currently single. And you and your ex each have to be at least 62 years old. In other words, eligible for Social Security benefits. Now, in general, say I'm the ex-wife, um, I am, when I claim my benefits, I am going to get the higher of my own benefit or half of my ex benefits. Let's say my ex's benefits are $3,000 a month. Half of that is $1,500. If I never work a day in my life, I file for benefits of full retirement age, I'm going to get that $1,500. But let's say I have my own earnings record and my own benefit is $2,000 a month. That's what I'm going to get. I'm never going to get a spousal benefit because my own retirement benefit is bigger. I'll get the bigger of the two. Now, what happens if I was born before 1954? I can do just like the married couple could do. If I wait till my full retirement age or older and I was born before 1954, I can say to Social Security, give me half of his benefit. Give me half of her benefit. They don't even need to know about it. You all just go through the Social Security Administration. You prove that you are who you say you are. You know, you have that marriage license, the divorce decree, proving that you were married at least 10 years and you are currently single to collect on a living ex. Now, what happens if it was a really ugly divorce? And maybe that ex-spouse said, I am never going to retire. and You are never going to get a dime of my Social Security. Well, Congress thought that might be a problem. So in addition to being married at least 10 years, divorced and currently single, if you are divorced at least two years and you're both at least 62 years old, you can collect on your ex even if your ex has not claimed his or her benefit. It's known as being an independently entitled spouse. Married couples can't do that. Like in my, my case, I had to claim Social Security in order to trigger a spousal benefit for my husband. If we were divorced, he could have collected on me even if I hadn't collected. Now, for all those sad divorce spouses who say, gee, I was born after January 1st, 1954, I can't do anything fancy, except if your ex dies. Now you are an eligible surviving ex-spouse. And here's where the rules get crazy. Uh, I told you, you must be married at least 10 years, divorced, currently single to collect on a living ex. But if you wait till 60 or later to remarry, you can collect on a dead spouse, even if you're married to somebody else. So here are the rules. You must have at least a decade between I do and I don't. And if you're going to take a second trip down the aisle, wait till 60 to do it. Now, here's a crazy scenario. Here's your Johnny Carson example. We have John and Mary are married for 10 years. They get divorced. Mary remains single. Then John marries his secretary, Susie, and they're married for 10 years and they get divorced and Susie remains single. Then John's one of those guys who doesn't really like to be alone and he meets Tiffany and Tiffany's 30 years old and they fall madly in love and get married. And now they have a little boy, Johnny, he's two years old and big John drops dead. Who gets benefits? Everybody gets benefits. Oh. The first ex-wife married at least 10 years before divorcing gets 100% of John's survivor benefit. She does not have to share 100% of what he was collecting when he died. So does the second ex-wife married at least 10 years, divorced. She gets 100%, that's 200%. Little Johnny, he's two years old, he gets 75% every month until he turns 18. And Tiffany, his mom, gets 75% every month until little Johnny turns 16. So when you worry about the trust fund going under, I'd worry more about the divorce rules. Okay. You know, it's interesting. In your book, you say that we cannot get advice from Social Security. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and yet I understand that they do, they do give some advice, or maybe they're not supposed to, but they do. Where is the line where Social Security can help people 
make decisions that uh, uh, that that somebody didn't have the money to pay an expert and felt that Social Security should help them do that. Where's the line? Well, keep in mind, let's put this in context. Social Security has more than 60,000 employees, a lot of really hardworking, dedicated individuals who had been working from their kitchen tables for the last two and a half years. Mm. The uh, field offices just reopened April 7th um, after the, uh, the pandemic. Now, what they're supposed to tell you and what they actually tell you, a lot of them go that extra mile and they're gonna say, listen, honey, this is what I think you should do. Um, a lot of them have been in that job for 30 years and the philosophy has changed. And in the old days, the idea was grab that money as soon as you can. There wasn't a lot of this, let's coordinate our claiming strategy because frankly, a lot of the law changes that made those coordinated strategies make sense weren't enacted until the year 2000. So if you have older workers who had been working and, and going on what they used to know, the, the advice they give you may not be pertinent or relevant. My feeling is social security, overworked people under a time crunch, their job is to process your application. Your job is to figure out the best time to claim those benefits. And if you need help to get it, whether it's through a free calculator like at aarp.org or to pay someone a modest fee to help you come up with an optimum claiming strategy, um, I think it's worth investing some of your time and possibly some of your money to come up with what is the best solution for you. For example, a good friend of mine, married couple situation where the husband was old enough to claim a spousal benefit and they went to the social security um, and the rep tried to talk them out of that strategy saying, oh no, no, you should both claim at 62, you'll get a lot more money. No, we don't wanna do that. So not only do you need to come up with the appropriate strategy for you, you have to have the, the confidence to stick to your guns if somebody's pushing back. So going back to these people who wrote in and they wanted to help figuring out what their smart steps would be in terms of the claiming social security. We, we've talked about the couple, we've talked about the divorcee. Uh, is there anything special for the individual that they should have in mind as they make that decision? Well, individual, which I would define as either someone who's never been married or someone who had been married for fewer than 10 years before divorcing and therefore does not qualify as an eligible divorce spouse. Basically, whenever you file for benefits, your age at the time you first claim is going to determine how much you get. So I usually say, certainly if you're still working, you want to wait until at least your full retirement age to claim benefits when the earnings restrictions go away. Um, does it make sense for a single person to delay up until age 70? That is a tougher question and really very dependent on your health and um, your other income sources. Because should you die before you claim, if you're married, your surviving spouse is likely to get a survivor benefit. If I'm single and I die before I claim social security, nobody gets that benefit. I don't have a survivor by definition. The money goes back into the social security pool for other beneficiaries. So. A lot of times for single people, it makes sense to go ahead and claim it for retirement age, even if you don't need the money and bank it. If nothing else, it will help pay your Medicare premiums, which are deducted directly from your Social Security benefits. Now, if that larger check waiting up until age 70 is going to make a big difference in your retirement income, well, then it's probably worth waiting. You really have to look at your overall retirement income picture and what's going to be right for you. Uh, Mary Beth, I, I did love the, the, the interview that you had with Wade Fowle. He is, is definitely, not only are you one of the sharpest, he too is one of the sharpest people in our industry. And uh, I hope that, uh, that our viewers tonight uh, will, 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 will go to the uh, Retirement Repair Shop podcast that you do and watch the interview with Wade Fowle, because I think it will give people a really great overview of the different ways of accessing your money 
uh, in retirement. I thought it was, it was wonderful. Right, because Wade is one of the top researchers yeah. uh, on the changing retirement. Our big issue is longevity. We are living so much longer than previous generations. We really do need to plan for at least a 30-year retirement. And we don't have those traditional guaranteed sources of income like a pension that perhaps our parents or grandparents did. So we have to figure out how to save for our retirement while we're working through our 401ks and IRAs. And then the harder part becomes how do we take that pot of money and stretch it out over 30 years in a way that will last as long as we do. We don't want to run out of money before we run out of breath. But we also don't want to deny ourselves unnecessarily by scrimping and saving. Um, some retirees have a really hard time of making that mental switch from I'm saving, I'm saving, I'm saving, I'm saving. Oh, I'm supposed to spend. I'm, I'm afraid to spend. How much can I spend? Um, so he talks about what works. And in some cases, um, maybe if you don't have a pension, um, and in addition to your social security, which is guaranteed income, maybe you do want some sort of annuity where you give a chunk of money to an insurance company that will pay you uh, a monthly payment or quarterly payment or whatever for the rest of your life, as long as you live. My philosophy is people should get a rough idea of what their fixed costs are in retirement. How much does it cost to keep a roof over your head, food in your fridge, pay your taxes, your health insurance, everything it takes to live? And then I like to match it up with what are my guaranteed source of income? I've got Social Security. That covers a chunk of it. Maybe I have a pension or an annuity. That covers another chunk. If my fixed costs are covered, I'm probably okay. And then I can just draw down my investments for those discretionary funds. If my fixed costs aren't covered, I might want to take some of those invested assets and maybe buy an annuity to fill in that gap. Or maybe I had a lot of equity tied up in my home. Maybe I want to figure out how do I access that? You know, some people would take out a home equity loan. The problem is in retirement, that's got to be paid back. And if you're on your fixed income, that can get tough. Uh, it can also be harder to qualify for a home equity loan if you're no longer working and don't have that paycheck. Um, some people turn to a reverse mortgage. And I know that's very controversial in some areas, but the idea is um, for people who are homeowners, at least 62 years old and have a lot of equity in their home, they can actually borrow against that home. You keep your title, you keep your ownership, you must keep it up in terms of insurance and taxes and maintaining it but you can draw money out either on a you know, regular basis or line of credit. That could be valuable going forward. And what's so important is any of those distributions are tax-free. And we are finding that so many retirees are shocked of how much they're paying in taxes in retirement, a lot more than they thought they were. And when their income is higher and they're paying these higher income taxes, often they're paying more for Medicare premiums as well because that is also tied to your income and retirement. So we like to look at ways of how can people who are nearing or even in retirement get some of their taxable money, their you know, retirement account money or, or other money into a tax-free column. Um, for some people, it's a good idea, particularly maybe in those years between when they retire and their income from working drops, and maybe before they actually claim social security at 70, they may have several years of lower income. That could be a great time to convert some of your traditional IRA money to a Roth IRA. What does that mean? It means I would pay taxes at the time I take money out of my traditional IRA and convert it to a Roth, but now I've created a pot of tax-free money for the future. And let's say I'm a few years down the road, and I look at my income taxes, and I look at my uh, Medicare premiums, and I think, wow, you know, I was $5,000 over that pushed me into the next income tax bracket or pushed me into a higher Medicare premium. And if I had just taken that $5,000 out of my tax-free Roth IRA instead of my regular retirement account, I could have lowered my income taxes and my Medicare premiums. It gets complicated. That's when it's really helpful 
to have a financial planner, particularly one that specializes in retirement income planning, because just like your working years, it's not what you make, it's what you keep, even more so in retirement. Since you uh, are bringing the financial planner here into the discussion, the first of the series uh, this month was about, do I need an advisor, financial planner? And uh, I would really like your perspective. Uh, we, we talked about hourly people and people who get paid by percentage of assets or commissions, but what advice, general advice would you give on how to find a planner and use a planner to make these very important life decisions that uh, doesn't require you to tie your money up and pay somebody 1% a year. Right. I think, you know, for so many Americans who are the bulk of their investments are in their 401k plans at work, that pretty much can serve them in their working years. But I think before you get to retirement, sort of that red zone of about five years before you retire is a good time to have a fiscal checkup. How am I doing? And what am I going to do when I leave this job and this paycheck and I take these lifetime savings? What do I do with them? That's where it can be really helpful, even if you're just play, paying a financial planner as a one-time create a retirement income plan for me. You can find people that will do that. Because in the old days, we used to think of financial planning or wealth management strictly from an investment standpoint. You know, this is a person who's going to put my money in stocks and bonds or whatever I need and maybe sell me insurance. Well, all those things have become very accessible from a consumer level to do their own. I can open up a Schwab account or go to Fidelity or Vanguard or whatever and do what I want as far as my investment goes. But I think a holistic financial planner that can look at what is your insurance situation? What happens if you die what are you leaving for your spouse? Are there survivor benefits on your pension or your IRA? How are they titled? How do you plan to leave money to your kids? Do you need long-term care insurance? What if you might need long-term care and you can't get long-term care insurance because it's too expensive or you medically don't qualify? What are other alternatives for that? I think that's the real value of a financial planner, looking holistically of I'm going to enter this new phase of life of retirement that holds these wonderful possibilities. And, you know, certainly I can only buy the life experiences that I can afford to buy based on what I've saved throughout my life, but they can make sure um, all the gaps are filled and they ask the questions that individuals might not think to ask. If I'm no longer working, I probably don't need disability insurance anymore, but I might need long-term care insurance, or I might need help as I sign up for Medicare to decide, do I need a Medigap supplemental policy, or do I need you know, a Medicare Advantage plan, which tends to be cheaper and all-inclusive, but limits me to a certain network of providers. Those are the important kinds of decisions I need help with. And sometimes you can find one person that will do it all. Sometimes you'll find that one person that can refer you out to other people like um, CPAs, tax attorneys, estate planning attorneys, whatever you need. It's important to have all the right documents in order because you don't wanna be a burden on your family either if you become ill towards the end of your life and need care or you leave a financial mess to your kids because you never took the time to think it through. This is, you know, I think, part of retirement, and, and I'm getting there at that phase myself, too, to make sure all of the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted so I can go off and enjoy my future retirement, and I know my family's taking care of the best of my ability. Well, that's wonderful help, wonderful advice. Uh, I don't see that we have any questions coming in, Jim. Is, is, uh, I, I, there you are. Anything? Well, I think we've done a we've done a great job of answering the questions that we've gotten. I do want to clarify if you if you are one of the people who asked that question and you don't feel like it was sufficiently answered, um, please let us know again and, and I'll um, I'll bring that back up. Let um, me let me jump into another topic since we have time. Yeah. Um, the one thing I want to stress is that retirement benefits and survivor benefits are two different pots of money. 
And if you are entitled to both, let's say you're married and you'll have your own retirement benefit, and now you're widowed, okay, I've got a retirement benefit and I potentially have a survivor benefit. Um, depending on my age and my situation, I may be able to claim one type of benefit first and then switch to the other bigger benefit later. I can do it in either order that benefits me and it doesn't matter when I'm born. There's no birth date restriction on this. So I'm gonna give you two examples. Let's say we have a widow. She's 62, she's young, um, she's not working. And um, her, she has her own retirement benefit, but it's smaller than her potential survivor benefit. And remember, a survivor benefit is worth 100% of what her late husband was collecting or entitled to collect when he died. So in sorry, her case- is there, is there any restriction on how long they were married? No, well, to- <laughs> To collect benefits as a survivor, you must have been married at least nine months and at time of death. Okay. To collect benefits as a spouse on a living spouse, let's say I've never worked, my husband has a social security benefit, I have to be married at least a year. To collect benefits as a divorce spouse, I have to be married at least 10 years and currently single. And to collect as a divorce surviving spouse, 10 years, and wait until at least 60 to remarry. Quick, repeat that. <laughs> so let's say we have this young widow, her benefit's smaller, her own retirement benefit. She may want to go ahead and claim her own retirement benefit as early as age 62, even though it's permanently reduced. Uh, she doesn't have to worry about the earnings restriction because she's not working. And even though her retirement benefits are permanently reduced, once she gets to her full retirement age, doesn't matter. She can now switch to her full survivor benefits and get the full survivor benefits for the rest of her life. Now let's switch the scenario. Maybe it's a husband. He lost his wife to breast cancer. He's still working. Uh, he's entitled to both his retirement benefit and a survivor benefit. His retirement benefit's probably bigger. He probably at his full retirement age wants to collect the survivor benefit. A survivor benefit is worth the maximum amount if you collect it at your full retirement age. It does not continue to grow by 8% a year. That's only a retirement benefit. So he, the surviving widower, would collect his survivor benefit his full retirement age, even if he's working, no earnings test after full retirement age. In the meantime, his own retirement benefit continues to grow by 8% a year. And at age 70, he uh, switches to his full survivor benefit. Wow, that's, thank you. That's, <laughs> I, I, I expect everyone to pass this test, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, wait a minute, Jim. They don't have to pass the test because I, I happen to know that Mary Beth allows uh, an open book test. All you have to do is have a copy of her Find book. book. <laughs> there you and, go. I'll tell you, it is, it is terrific. It includes all of this information. Well, speaking of which, how do you buy my book? Um, it's an ebook, which means you go to the website, which is www.maximizingsocialsecuritybenefits.com. It's $29.95. It's updated every year. That's the 2022 version. You pay for it and it is downloaded and you can print it out if you like. It's only 50 pages because I don't think anyone should have to read more than 50 pages about social security. And guess what? You don't have to read 50 pages. You can go right to the section that says married, divorced, single, uh, families with children. Speaking of children, did you know, as we talked about the little case of John and Susie and Mary and Tiffany and little Johnny, that it makes sense if John the father dies and there's a minor dependent child like Johnny, that Johnny would get survivor benefits every month until he turns 18. But do you know if John the father merely collects retirement benefits, he's alive and he has a minor dependent child like Johnny, Johnny gets dependent benefits too, worth 50% of dad's full retirement age benefit every month until Johnny turns 18. I used to call that the Viagra College Fund because we had so many older dads remarrying and having younger families. You know, that could be a reason that maybe an older father who's no longer working might want to claim early at 62 
to trigger a benefit for a dependent child who can only get benefits until the child is 18. If that kid is, uh, you know, 14 and dad's 62, he may want to claim now because if dad waits till 66, the kid's going to be 18 and not be able to get benefits. So that plays in, gee, if I have a minor dependent child. And guess what? There are so many grandparents raising grandchildren. In some cases, those grandchildren would qualify for benefits if they live with the grandparents, they are tax dependents, and either the child's parents are deceased or disabled. So it's a little more complicated, but quite possible. A child, a dependent child, is considered a biological child, an adopted child, a stepchild, and in some cases, a grandchild. This same rule, dependent benefits, also applies if you have a permanently disabled adult child who is disabled before the age of 22. If dad claims a retirement benefit, there's a disabled adult child in the household, that child gets half of dad's benefits every month for the rest of that child's life. It's tricky when you have a, a dependent adult disabled child because they are likely getting other get benefits like supplemental security insurance and maybe Medicaid and food stamps and housing allowances. Um, when they automatically get a, a social security benefit as a dependent on a parent's benefit, it can affect their income tested other benefits. So that's where you really wanna to talk to um, a disability attorney who is well-versed in this. There are ways to set up a trust for that disabled child to have the social security benefit go directly into the trust and only enough money comes out to stay under the monthly or annual income limitations. Mm -hmm. So, uh, did, Jim, did you have a question? I did actually. I have a, there's a couple more in the chat that I was going to. Oh, great! I Good. Was ask about. Um, so, one uh, one question. Uh, looking at your crystal ball, Mary Beth, um, do you think the Trust Act is a good uh, step toward resolving the Social Security shortfall, and and why is that? I'm sorry, the Trust Act. I'm not sure what you mean. All right. Well, pause on that one. Let me let the two of you talk. I'll, I'll come back to the Trust Act. The, um, the question, the other question I have. So you've got Paul, expert in investments, Mary Beth, expert in Social Security. Is there any benefit to collecting your Social Security early and investing that until, and you, can you do better if you take those, those assets yourself, you do better in those investments than the government uh, escalation factor uh, uh, equation would? Well, um, let me, uh, I'll weigh in and then we'll let Paul, the investment expert, weigh in as well. Let's look at the delayed retirement credits, 8% per year. That applies for every year you postpone benefits beyond your full retirement age up until age 70. So if my full retirement age is 66, I can theoretically get four years at 8% a year for a 32% increase. I think if you're saying, if I take the money, and invest it on my own. Well, I could put it in the stock market and maybe I make 30%, maybe I lose 30%. I don't think that's a fair comparison. I think I need to say, if I took this money and invested it in a guaranteed investment, how would that compare to social security? Well, for the past decade or so, we have been living in a zero interest rate environment. And although interest rates are now starting to crop, creep up, they're still below historical averages. While on the other hand, the government is guaranteeing us 8% a year. Let me tell you a little history of how we got to this 8% a year. May I, do we have time for a short story? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Back in 1983, when social security was really going broke um, and Congress knew it and they didn't know what to do. And as dysfunctional as our current Congress is, um, it was no picnic back in 1984, 83. To refresh your memory, we had Ronald Reagan in the White House, the great Republican communicator. And we had Tip O'Neill, the great Democrat of Massachusetts as Speaker of the House. Two political lions who did not see eye to eye on anything, but they knew social security was so important and more importantly, old people voted. So they did what they usually do in Washington when you have a really tough problem, you punt. You appoint a bipartisan commission to come up with a solution 
and recommend a solution to Congress for an up and down vote. And that's what they did in 1983. And they appointed a guy that no one had ever heard of to lead this commission, but you may remember him, Alan Greenspan. Long before he was chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, he was head of the bipartisan Social Security Commission. And one of the many smart things he said was, this is back in 1983, you know, everybody is collecting Social Security at 62, but Americans are living so much longer. What can we do to incentivize Americans to delay benefits until they can get a bigger benefit later? Well, then they started talking about these delayed retirement credits. And I, I explained that they're 8% a year. They weren't 8% a year in 1983. They were 3% a year. But the only problem was interest rates were 18%. Who in their right mind would delay claiming Social Security for a mere 3%? You could stick the money under your mattress and do better. So the commission said, let's gradually raise the delayed retirement credit by a half a percentage point a year until it gets to what? What do you think, guys? 8%? Sounds pretty conservative to me. After all, interest rates are 18%. Okay, we're going to cap it off at 8%, and we will apply it to anyone born in 1943 or later when they reach their full retirement age. So here's a math question. 1943 plus the full retirement age of 66 adds up to 2009. What else happened in 2009? Greatest stock market crash since the Great Depression. And for the first time, the government was saying, I'll give you an 8% a year to wait. That's the reason people talk about delaying Social Security benefits until they're worth more. Now, as I said, interest rates are starting to creep up. I think if interest rates got to five or 6%, at that point, I might say, you know, probably not worth it for me to take my chances. Maybe I'll claim social security at full retirement age. But until it gets to that point, 8% a year guaranteed is a smoking hot deal. All yours, Paul. <laughs> well, and think about the advantages to a surviving spouse. Uh, I mean, a married couple, uh, that's pretty selfish uh, if, if they're in, in any chance of, of living a long time. I, here's the anecdotal evidence I have, having been around the business for about 60 years. The people who take their Social Security and are going to invest and make more money, uh, I don't think typically do what they thought they were going to do. And in fact, on average, they're going to come out behind. That, that's my experience uh, from people who, in essence, have a great idea. And so often, I mean, it's not so different than people thinking they were back uh, when interest rates were 18 and, and, and thinking that eight was going to be cheap. Right, uh, right. Recency bias costs people a lot of money. And this is, it is truly one of the real bargains. Uh, on the other hand, for people who just, this may be their first time to have money to play with. Let me give you a great do-over strategy. You just gave a great example. Let's say um, we have a husband and wife and the husband claims his benefits early at 62, just because he can, he's fine with that. He's taking a 25% haircut. It doesn't occur to him until later, wow, if I get less money now and I die first, my widow is going to have a smaller benefit. Is there anything I can do about it? Actually, you can. There are two do-over strategies. The first one is anyone can change their mind within the first 12 months of claiming Social Security benefits and withdraw their application for benefits. But there's a catch. If you withdraw your application, you have to pay back any of the benefits you have received, but it wipes the slate clean as if you never claim benefits. So at a later date when you're older and it's as if you're claiming for the first time and get a bigger benefit. But that puts a lot of people off if you have to pay benefits back. Here's a second opportunity, but you have to wait till your full retirement age or later. At that point, you can suspend your benefits. It means any of those checks you've been receiving stop. But now they're going to start growing by 8% a year. So let me give you a mathematical example. That husband whose full retirement age benefit was $2,000 a month at 66, but he claims four years early at 62. He doesn't get that $2,000 a month he gets $1,500. He, he took a 25% haircut. He collects that for four years. He gets to his full retirement age of 66, and now he suspends his benefit. Doesn't have to pay anything back. He starts earning delayed retirement credits, 32% over 
four years, if I multiply 75%, which is the amount he got at 62, times 1.32, those four years of delayed retirement credit, it comes out to 99%. He has effectively restored his full retirement age benefit by age 70. And if he dies first, that's the amount his widows would get. Hmm. I love that math. That's, that's Paul, I think you're on, um, you're on, you're on, on you. Home. You have another question? Um, I, I just, just to clarify a couple of things um, for this survivor benefit, um, is the survivor benefit uh, still in existence if the deceased spouse was on SSA disability? Oh, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. Social Security is really three programs. We think of it as retirement primarily, but it is also disability if I am unable to work or terminally ill before full retirement age, and then it's a survivor benefit. For those people who qualify for Social Security disability benefits because they can no longer work, it's a case-by-case -case basis. It's not automatic, like claiming retirement. And the delay for processing your application could be two or three years. It's a very long process. But if, let's say I am approved for Social Security benefits and say I'm uh, 60 years old, I get disability, I'm effectively getting what would have been my full retirement age benefit but instead of waiting till 66, I'm getting it at 60 because I'm disabled. When I, and my check say social security disability because it's coming out of the disability trust fund. When I reach my full retirement age, my checks are now gonna say retirement because now it's coming out of the retirement trust fund, but the amount remains the same. And if I later die and I have a surviving spouse, that is the amount that will become my widow or widower's survivor benefit. And remember, at that point, their own smaller benefit goes away. So even in a best case scenario, a household social security income is going to drop anywhere from a third to a half when one spouse dies. Yes, the survivor benefit will continue, but that other smaller social security benefit goes away. So that's why it's so important when you're meeting with this financial advisor of saying, if I die first, what am I leaving my wife? In addition to my social security survivor benefit, does my IRA have a survivor benefit? Does my pension have a survivor benefit? Is there life insurance? You know, what, what do we do to protect them? Because even if I die, the household expenses probably aren't gonna go down that much. We need income to continue. Right. All right, another question changing topic slightly. Um, so if I'm married to a person who used to be a, a citizen of another country, is now an American citizen, has a work history in that other country like New Zealand say, and, uh, and, and has a work history here in the United States, um, can that work history factored in a foreign country be factored into their social security equation? It depends on what the country is. There's something okay. called a totalization agreement. Total, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. For example, maybe I worked uh, 20 years in Canada and 25 in the US. Canada and the US have an agreement that we can combine our work years under the two systems to come up with one benefit under one of the systems. That is not a universal agreement. It's on a case by case basis often in the case with Australia, New Zealand, a lot of the Western European countries. Um, but let's say my spouse or I uh, worked overseas and I have a pension from a work in another country where I didn't pay social security benefits. It's just like I'm a school teacher in Texas or Louisiana or California. I didn't pay into the social security system because we have our own retirement system. The rules are different for getting the benefits out. There are two separate rules when it comes to people who receive pensions based on work where they didn't pay FICA taxes, whether it's from a state and local government or in some cases, a foreign government. If I've worked in the US private sector long enough to be eligible for social security benefit, I have at least those 10 years of work or 40 credits, um, I'll get a social security benefit, but it's going to be reduced because I have this other pension That's based true. on work where I didn't pay FICA taxes. That's called the windfall elimination provision. Think windfall worker, I get a benefit, but it's reduced. There is a more onerous rule that affects people with these public pensions 
maybe that Texas school teacher who never worked on social security and never planned to get a social security benefit, but her husband works for a Dell computer, she figures she'll get a spousal benefit. Maybe not because there's this government pension offset rule, think GPO, grumpy partner. It says, if you have a public pension based on work where you didn't pay FICA taxes and now you try to claim social security as a spouse or a survivor, we are going to reduce any potential social security benefit by two thirds of the amount of your pension with no dollar limit. So if you had a $6,000 teacher pension, two thirds of that is $4,000. $4,000 subtracted from any potential social security benefit, go to wipe it out. So in those cases, I tell married couples where one of them is a public employee with one of these pensions, maybe this couple does not want to delay collecting social security for the private sector um, spouse, because the main reason you want to delay is to maximize the survivor benefit. And if your spouse can't get a survivor benefit, why wait? Mm -hmm. That's great. So when somebody is um, is nearing retirement and w when do should they start the, or or nearing the point at which they're uh, they're going to file? At what point should they start the process? If you're if you're wanting to if you're wanting to file as soon as you're eligible, when should you start the process? Well, first of all, the thought process, I'd say start at least 10, 10 years in advance and really think this through. The other thing I want Americans to realize that decision of when to retire and when to claim social security benefits are two separate decisions. They do not have to occur at the same time. You can retire at 62 if you want and maybe still delay claiming social security to 70. And in between, maybe you're drawing down some of your 401k and your IRA as a way of buying yourself a bigger social security benefit later. But if you're saying, how far in advance do I physically need to apply for benefits, you can apply for your social security benefits four months, up to four months before you want those benefits to begin. And I encourage people to apply online. Again, social security field offices have been closed for two and a half years. They have really improved the online application process. And frankly, the computers don't screw up. They recognize your birth year. They recognize your marital status. You just follow the prompts. You can do that if you're filing as a married person, requesting spousal benefits if you were born before 1954. Um, if you're divorced, you can start the process online, but you're going to have to contact Social Security as far as handing over these documents, proving that you were married um, at least 10 years before being divorced. And survivors need to contact Social Security directly. You cannot file for survivor benefits online. Mary Beth, if someone has a question and they go to Google and write the question and put the name Mary Beth Franklin after the question, or investment news, Mary Beth Franklin after the question, are they likely to get your answer? Because well, it's I say, probably something. Cut out the middleman. Go ahead and email me directly at MB Franklin. That's Mary Beth Franklin, MB Franklin at investmentnews.com. I do try to answer every question I get. Please say you heard me on this program that I was talking to Paul. Um, I will say I have over 30,000 unanswered emails. I'm not making that up. But if you're at the top of my list, I, I answer hundreds a week. It's just if you get too far down in the queue, just send it again. <laughs> That's great. Well, you've been you've been wonderful. And uh, again, give us that uh, that address, that URL to get your book. Thank you. Um, you everything I just talked about today, you can find in my ebook, and you go to www.maximizing social security benefits.com you can also listen to my podcast which is called the retirement repair shop any place you listen spotify apple podcast whatever and listen carefully to the intro and outro music it's original music by my son dj throwdown uh, that's great <laughs> and 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 also this show will be uh, housed both at uh, archived at uh, BCF Bainbridge Community Foundation, uh, Bainbridge um, CF org, and at paulmerriman.com. Uh, and so, if uh, folks who are watching today want to uh, uh, 
uh, share it. I hope that they'll tell people. And we will be sending this out to all the people who decided to garden tonight <laughs> instead. We had a little bit of sun, I think. And uh, you got to grab that sunshine while you can where you live. <laughs> right. Now, you've been a jewel, and, and it is interesting. We had Larry Swedro as our other special guest. Two people who try to answer every email, to every question they get, and uh, that's a that's a passion that we're happy that you have. Thank you. And so remember, much. your questions keep me sharp. It lets me know where the confusion lies, so I can write more illuminating columns. <laughs> that's great, Jim. Thank you too, and thank thanks you both. to DCF. They're wonderful, and and uh, we'll we'll. Hopefully see you again. I hope you'll come back, Mary Beth. I'd be delighted. Okay. Thank you and safe travels. Yeah, thank Thanks you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.